Hey everyone, happy, uh, happy May. I'm gonna get this kicked off. Uh, okay, so welcome to the ITB2 Transmark community meeting for May. Um, it's great to see everyone here. I'm going to, um, I'm gonna give you a really, really quick um, update, uh, foundation update, really talking about our, our conference that's uh, coming up. Um, hope to get some feedback from you. And then we will jump into two uh, agenda items. We've got a pretty neat talk on uh, FIRE to I2B2 uh, Transformation Toolkit, and then an overview of the new um, ACT ontology. We don't have Michelle with us today. I don't think. Is she there? Michelle Morris? No. So uh, Jeff Klan is, uh, is going to be presenting the ontology. All right, so in September, we have our annual um, I2B2 Transmart um, meeting. Um, the meeting date is the 21st to the 22nd. But what we're trying to do is advertise, just because September is such a fabulous month to come to Boston, we're trying to advertise to get folks to come uh, for the majority of the week. And let me explain why. So on Tuesday, the, uh, the 19th, um, Zach Kohani has his um, annual precision medicine conference um, at Harvard. Um, this is a super popular, really well attended um, event um, that people are, are, are really excited to, to come to. So if you're interested, you can come Tuesday, um, listen in on this event. I'm assuming that a, a, the lion's share of that is really going to be focused on um, uh, AI. Um, Zach, who is uh, one of the um, inventors of I2B2, uh, and also the chairman of our board um, of, of directors, um, just uh, co-authored a book um, with a number, a couple of folks. Um, it's on Amazon now. It was just released about a week ago, um, The AI Revolution in Medicine. So if you're interested in, uh, in reading that, it's, uh, it's available on, um, on Amazon. Um, Zach also has a new role as uh, editor-in-chief of a new uh, journal as part of the New England Journal of Medicine called um, uh, a, uh, New England uh, AI. So I think you're gonna, you're already hearing, we're already hearing so much about AI and, and chat GPT, but we're gonna be hearing more. So that's gonna be a pretty neat conference. The rest of the, the uh, week, so we've got, Tuesday, the Precision Medicine. Wednesday, we have a, a group of people that um, have a symposium on COVID AI. And this is actually a specific um, grant and a, a, a number of people within the, the a number of people within the ITB2 community and, and beyond um, are going to be joining that symposium. They have opened that up to all participants. So that's another, um, another uh, venue that um, it's actually located in the same place that, that we're going to have our ITB2 conference. So that's a that's Wednesday. And then Thursday and Friday will be the, the annual meeting. Um, we're developing the agenda. I think it's going to be a pretty neat agenda with um, a lot of information about a lot of new things that are that are happening um, within within ITB2. Um, certainly Zach Ohani, I think, is going to be our, our keynote speaker uh, talking about you know AI and medicine. So um, he's he's always um, full of uh, he's always very entertaining and, and uh, full of exciting things, so that will be fun. The second day will be more of a technical uh, deep dive. So we are really interested in hearing um, from folks. The agenda is not full yet. So if somebody has like a specific use case they would like to present, um, you know, if they want to bring a poster, you can bring a poster. We're not really, you know, we're not advertising that, but certainly we um, we can be flexible. So we hope to see you at the symposium. Um, just a reminder that we uh, will have a, a new ITB2 release coming out um, probably in the fall timeframe, which will coincide with our September meeting um, nicely. Um, and we've got some, you know, it's chock full of um, pretty neat stuff, a, a new, completely new user interface that you may have seen some demos recently. Um, we actually have a public demo. Um, I'll post it in the, the URL in the, the chat in a few minutes of the new UI. Um, there's also a lot of work on, you know, I, I2B2 on OMOP out of the box that uh, Jeff has talked about, and um, you'll hear more and more about that. Um, you know, uh, uh, improved uh, data export and derived fact library and other things. So that's that's coming. So 
a lot of uh, a lot of new features, a lot of a lot of great stuff. We always um, we always let you know that if you want to get more involved in in some of our working groups, we have an ontology working group, ETL user interface, and we also have a group called the Committee on Technology um, that meets on a monthly basis. And we that that um, agenda varies, but we have um, you know most of the ITB two, uh, team there. Um, as well as others. So if you ever want to go to join that on a regular basis, you can. If you just want to pop in, if you want to talk about a specific thing at that meeting, um, uh, Michael Lynn from uh, Mayo joined uh, the meeting a couple of months ago, and he, he and his team had developed a, uh, a plug-in um, that they were they were really proud of, and they thought that the uh, the group would want to hear about. So they came and and did a, a deep dive with the group. So. Um, we, we definitely want to hear from you, and, and if you want to talk to the people who, you know, developed the system, you, you have that opportunity. Um, if you want to present at one of these meetings, the July agenda is open. September will have the symposium, and November is open. So with that, I will turn it over to Chi Lee and Mike Mendez. Yeah, that's great. And uh, let me just uh, share my PowerPoint. Are you able to see the full screen? Yes. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Diane. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak and present uh, at this uh, uh, community call. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about uh, how uh, the inner system iris technology is uh, supporting uh, this very interesting uh, data pipeline from fire to i2b2 uh, just very quickly about the uh, inner systems most of the folks know us as the core data platform supporting epic and uh, so we've been doing this for over 45 years uh, as epic grew uh, we are growing as well and uh, really uh, uh, ensuring that uh, all the data can be uh, managed efficiently, all the read and write, and so on and so forth, and uh, can scale. Um, and we also have uh, many uh, customers outside the US as well with our own EHR outside the US. And uh, so the I2B2 customer base all over the world, I'm pretty sure we cross path quite a bit. Now, the key part is uh, around our, uh, really around our, uh, some of the interoperability uh, solution that we provide. Uh, around moving the data from one place to another, transformations. So we do that quite a bit, and uh, that has been very mature technology for us. So it's a super exciting that we can make this as a community addition that we can uh, help the I2B2 community here as well. So in a nutshell, uh, from a 2023 point of view, uh, we are building these capabilities, uh, but today we're focusing on the fire-oriented uh, interoperability. You can probably find out other uh, capabilities we're doing around the fire, uh, including bulk fire, which is pretty big uh, this year, and also fire SQL builder. You can analyze data in fire repositories using SQLs. Um, but uh, today we're talking about uh, the fire to I2B2. Uh, so I only have this uh, high level slide, and then I'll give it to uh, uh, pass it over to Mike. Uh, so from our uh, point of view, based on some of the early requirements, is that uh, uh, we're looking at uh, on the left hand side where the fire data. Uh, is made available from any sources, uh, which could be a EMR source, could be other uh, third-party services that can generate the fire resources. And uh, our software, which is InterSystem Iris for Health, is designed to take any of these uh, sources. Uh, in the past, we always look at HL7, CDA documents, and a fire resources. But in this case, instead of uh, uh, going to other target systems, uh, we're making a transformation uh, into the I2B2 core and uh, use it, utilizing the ontology and um, uh, so that we can determine which data uh, needs to go where. And uh, so this is a build on the iris for health uh, We have a community edition that you can use for free up to a certain size uh, constraints, but uh, the technology itself is full featured, allows you to uh, take any type of input data, in this case, fire and send the data into I2B2 core. So that's it for my part. And uh, Mike, you would like to take over? Uh, yes, if I can unmute myself. Yes. Uh, so let me share my screen or share my presentation. Uh, 
Okay, same question. Now uh, you can see the full screen. Yes, looks good. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so yeah, thanks, Diane. Thanks, Chi, for all the help and everything. It's been a pleasure working with Inner Systems on this. Uh, so, like she was saying, basically, we were going to, the project goal was we had a, a fire object that we were getting from Care Evolution. It had all of like the data that we needed diagnosis con uh, conditions, laboratory, medication, immunization, procedures. And we need to load that into Iris. And so then we can then use the um, Iris, uh, like the ITB2 within Iris to query the data and then potentially add more data into it. So, um, so um, Inner Systems and their partners uh, basically kind of developed this whole cache application. And then I was working with them and then I grabbed the, the code base from them and I basically extended it. It's still a work in progress. We're still, it's not a finished product yet, uh, but we're, we're very close, we're getting close. So, uh, so yeah, so that was basically the goal is we wanna basically then query it and utilize it. Uh, so the idea is uh, Care Evolution, whether they give it to us, uh, they'll, put, they'll put it on an S3 bucket and then we, ex we pull it down from the S3 bucket put it into a certain folder that the Iris uh, application is looking at. And once it's there, it will then take that data, uh, process any of the patients out of it. If there are new patients, then it'll create a new patient uh, mapping table entry for it and give it a new patient now. If it's an existing patient, it will figure out what their care evolution ID is and then cross-reference it in the patient mapping table to an existing patient num and then load any data associated to that. Uh, we are doing the typical way that we do ETL within ITB2 is basically just, when we do a new reload, we basically truncate the current one and just do a completely new refresh instead of trying to merge. Uh, as a lot of you are familiar with the ITB2, uh, it's hard to do merges because uh, things might change last month um, when, you, uh, when you already did the reload and then trying to merge those changes is just complicated. So it's easier just to say truncate, reload, and everything's fresh, just let it go. And hopefully it doesn't take too long to run. Um, so yeah, so the idea was once we got that uh, fire object, it basically will then process it. It'll, it will create, it uses some internal uh, inner systems table storage arrays. And then eventually it, would, it gets output into the like to be just a schema that we're all familiar with. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so it basically as the fire object is just a JSON format. Uh, Care Revolution gave us a, a sample one that we could use. So we utilize that to do the most of the development. We now have internally uh, a production one with real patient data. So I'm in the process of analyzing that to make sure that it is compatible with the sample one they gave. There could be some minor tweaks that we have to do, but overall it seems like that should be okay. Um, and so, yeah, so as far as the data that we, as I mentioned, it's their typical EHR data that we want. Okay. And so with, so this is kind of a view of the inner systems uh, product application. So once, uh, I'll, show, I'll, have, I'll show a little demo of this, how to do this. So, uh, so everything was written in cache. All these like services are all cache, ser are ca files associated in cache format. And so the first thing it goes is it gets that uh, in the left-hand side where it says services, you have the services get bio file. That's the primary entry point into it. And then in the other red box, it has that file path. So that's where the file, once we get it from the S3 bucket, we drop it into that folder path, file path, and then it will pick it up and then it will start going to this get, uh, fi get fire file. And then it'll go to the process. The first one it does is the process main. And then it will go through each of the individual files. And then, so one of the files will be patients. One will be like observation facts, encounter, procedures. It will go through each individual one and load that data into the uh, 
iris system and then eventually turns into the observation fact. Um, and so once it gets loaded in, this is kind of a, a, a sample select statement. As you can see, it has like the select patient one, which we're familiar with from the observation fact. And then you can join it to the concept dimension to, uh, to say, okay, I just want all the labs. And then you can really uh, narrow it down and say, okay, I just want birth dates after 1972. So, so yeah, so once it's in the ITB2, you can basically do exactly what you do with normal ITB2. Uh, and then this is, so once it's actually got loaded and the ontologies and everything is set, this is just a screenshot of actually doing a query of metformin with uh, gender. And then there's 82 patients who have, who are, have a gender and then is currently taking metformin. And this is data that was coming from the EHR system, uh, from that prior object, I should say. Uh, and I'll show this on the, uh, so this is, uh, the, this is the URL to on localhost to the uh, intersystems uh, FIA server, it's um, the typical port, which is 52773. And then it's under the ITBT FIA release four. And then I'll, sh I'll show in the demo that this is kind of how you like contest it. And if you were to do like the export file test and then the visual trace, then you would see something like this where you can actually trace and analyze as the fire object is going through the inner systems uh, pipeline kind of sim similar to what she has shown in one of his slides, I think his second slide. And so, so let me just uh, stop sharing and let me share my whole screen. I want to show various aspects in, uh, okay, so one thing is I need to make sure I'm still connected, okay. Um, so the inner systems, uh, let me see if this is the right one. So this, I'm logging into the inner system. Okay. Um, so this is actually a Docker image that uh, inner systems has released. So you can, basically it gets a whole Iris uh, for health install. It has all the ITV2 stuff in it. And so if we go into that product configuration, as you can see, this is that same get service file. And if we click on it, you can see that right here, this is the file path that I had mentioned earlier. This is where you would drop your uh, your fire object into. And then this is where the archive path is. And then the error folder path. Before I continue. So Diane, how am I on time? I don't wanna, I know Jeff has to talk. You're, you're good. I think oh. uh, how long Jeff probably only needs about 15 minutes. So you're, you're good. Okay. Good. Yeah. Ten's fine. Oh, okay. <laughs> and this is going to <laughs> one o'clock. Okay. So great. Okay. So I can continue going on in depth of this. Uh, yeah. So once, once you uh, drop a file in, it goes through the process, as you can see, some of these are red because they're uh, something had failed, but you can easily look at your log. And then as you can see in here, uh, it shows you that, okay, this one failed to move this file to the archive file. Uh, most likely the reason for that was because I probably moved the files root and then in assistance is probably running as Iris and then it was a permission issue, most likely. Um, but yeah, it shows you, and then you can, within the code, you can do like traces and info. Yep. As you can see, message was processed. Like, so. So then how do you actually do this programming aspect of it? And that's where this is cool, kind of cool. So the, using just standard Visual Studio code, you can actually connect up to the systems uh, <laughs> environment. This is that same machine as PH, uh, MGB LX uh, DX1. As you see, it's DX1 here. And the way you actually do it is under, uh, where is it, extensions. You type in inner systems, and because I've already done it, uh, it's there. But you have this inner systems uh, extension pack, and it would know it, if you didn't install it like I had, you would have an install button here. And then you just click on install, and it just boom, installs it. And then at that point, then you can uh, 
what is it? Uh, in the Explorer, it will uh, by default. Uh, where is it? No. I think because I've added it, it will default to localhost, uh, but you can easily add a new one. And that's what I did is I just uh, added a new one and then I just put in the URL, gave it a name, gave it uh, like uh, put the username and password in and so. But then if we take a look, so these are all the uh, uh, objects in it. And as you see, you have Iris on fire. And then in here you have like, this is the messaging one. Uh, the util, I think this is the main one. Uh, so I'm gonna allow that. Uh, and so, yeah, so yeah, this is the main one. So right now it's basically, this is like clearing the indexes. This is that uh, Iris on fire internal um, structure. So what it does is it takes the stuff, I think it just loads it in as a raw file into uh, tables, and then it starts processing those tables into the ITB2. Um, and so, yeah, so like this is generate the links for the patient. So as you can see, it has like the patient mapping table, which we're familiar with. Um, so yeah, so there's lots of code here that basically does the uh, mapping. You have your uh, visit dimension mapping, patient dimension. So, uh, and then in the transformations, if we look at the uh, patient dimension one, say, this is basically now transferring from like the, the fire object into ITB2 into the patient dimension table. And so this is basically the code for that. So I just want to, I know I don't want to go depth into the code, too, which I kind of already did. But anyway, I, I just wanted to show that you can easily uh, make changes and it's actually on the fly. So if you make changes here, it will then like, so if I was to, oh, let me make sure I'm logged in. So if I was to make a uh, like a chain, oh, can I edit? Oh, I'm in the read only. Oh, never mind. I, uh, but I can't, it will be taking too long to change it to non-read only. But if I wasn't in the read only and I made a change, it would then upload that change to this inner systems here. And then what I could do is I could drop a new file in and see if I put a new login, I could see the login over here. And then as it progresses on. Uh, the last thing I kind of want to show was actual, uh, so this is, I am actually on this machine right here and in fire. So these are the fire objects that the sample fire objects I got from care evolution. And so it was, a, uh, a G a, like a zip file. I think I unzipped it. Each one of these was a G zip file. So then I gzip them and so the way it has it has this patient mapping right here this is the care evolution identifier to uh, to their uh their internal id and so this is where i can do the mapping uh, and so then you have like your medications your encounters and so basically what i do is i just take one of these files and then under um i think it's uh, iris on uh, i2b2 on iris i2b2 on iris uh, so this is the, the docker image but everything's really in that this data files so in this data so in this data file if we go back to this one and go to settings this uh, data files right here is the same one as this one so if i was to uh, Try this fire patient patient zero. Um, let me just replace this with a four. Save this. It should kick off a process now that that has a new one. I'm hoping. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it, it just kicked off something. I was trying to read that file and because uh, I modified. But as you can see, it, it's watching that directory and, and then taking anything that's new and then processing it and then runs it through ITP2. And so if we just take a look at the quick sequel of this. Uh, so if we take a look at uh, ITP2 tables. Oh. The schema is uh, oh, it's under public. 
on the under table. So these, as you can see, are all the typical ITB2 tables. And so if we take a look at like the, say the patient mapping and uh, I'll just select, select stuff from, uh, and this is all demo data, so this is not real data. I'm not sure why it's taking so long. Uh, Unless for some reason I've loaded lots of data into that and it's taking so long, I'm not sure. Uh, like I said, this is a work in progress. So, uh, yeah, exit page. Oh, shoot. Um, But anyway, I just wanted to, uh, to show that, yeah, we're progressing and taking that fire object and getting into ITB2. Um, once we actually have a final product, I could probably do another community call and show a final fully working version of this. Uh, so. <laughs> Demo was going great until the end. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, so yeah, so that was, I just wanted to show that. Any questions by anyone? Or any comments? So, so Mike, I, I have a, a question um, yep. for you, really for you and, and T. So, um, so this is, this is a, a toolkit that uh, is a, available on the inner systems through, through inner systems, right? Open source through inner systems? Yeah, it's on the GitLab. And um, it's available to anybody. How, how's the, I'm going to put you guys on the spot. How's the documentation on this? Like, is the documentation in a pretty good place where people can pick this up and start to play with it? Or or kind of where, where are you with, with this being finalized and, and, and um, making it available for people to actually start to play with it? Um, so the documentation is pretty good. Uh, give me one second. Actually, Chi, do you want to finish up? And at, at that point, I can find the GitLab and then I can show the GitLab after that. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay, so, so let me just, just uh, let me just actually, do that. It's right on that demo page. But anyway, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this is the page and uh, I'll, I'll copy paste it in there as well. And uh, um, but I just want to quickly mention the the. Uh, performance aspects of it. Um, so when uh, when Mike mentioned uh, Cache, uh, Cache is the previous name for our Iris data platform. Uh, it is used by Epic as well. And uh, so it's, uh, I just wanna connect the dots here. Uh, so this is a uh, available on the GitLab, uh, GitHub, where we have, uh, uh, oh, actually it's not the case, but uh, uh, we did a benchmarking on the 63,000 patients. Uh, th these are, uh, I believe these are the, the same COVID data sets uh, that have been used to uh, run some of the performances uh, benchmarking. Uh, so we have a set of queries uh, that we did and uh, we try to just uh, uh, use the direct to SQL command. Uh, so the main thing I wanna show you is uh, this is uh, uh, the I2P on Postgres. And uh, Iris SQL, we issued a command called a tune table. Uh, and uh, uh, so you can see most of these queries. Uh, it's a small patient set, it's only 63,000. Uh, but uh, uh, from a, a number of microsecond point of view, uh, all of these queries are uh, basically now it's uh, less than 1% of the original time it takes. And of course, you know, in the, it's all, if it, the original time is three seconds, it's still th only three seconds. Uh, but uh, as you are running uh, complex uh, queries uh, generated from uh, uh, the cohort builder, I think uh, this could actually be quite useful uh, as we're improving the performance. Uh, so Iris is a is a uh, fairly good. Uh, hopefully, it's uh, it's something that uh, if you're considering Postgres and uh, you're thinking about maybe you should want to look at Iris. You know, certainly the performance will be uh, one area we'll continue to not only it's uh, pretty decent, uh, but also will continue to improve as well. Now, Mike, are you ready? 
Uh, yes, I'm ready. Okay, let me share my. Uh, okay, I'll just do desktop again. <laughs> it's easier. Okay, so yeah, so I'm here at the uh, the GitHub, the Iris, Iris on I to be too, and basically, yeah. So this kind of talks about. Uh, what the Mike, can I, Mike, can I, can I interrupt you for a minute? Um, yeah. so I see you, you. You're going through the documentation. That's really good. You know, Rob asked the, the the really important question of like what what's the use case that this is trying to solve. I think that, that maybe we should take a, a minute to, to answer yeah, that. Yeah, definitely. The use case we're looking at this is, uh, as you know, fire data is going to become more av more available. Uh, I don't certainly need to educate uh, the folks on this call. You know, lots of the uh, news, lots of the uh, regulations about uh, enable patient to share data and organizations required to using fire standards to share data. So we're going to see uh, lots of patient data become available uh, in a fire format. And uh, so this is very important. And uh, uh, so to create I2B2 repositories, uh, number one is if there is a simpler way to get data from the EHR using fire standards, uh, that hopefully will reduce the amount of work that you had to map tables and uh, do all these things. And uh, so for me, I think this is a great use case uh, to leverage fire uh, to help with uh, research data repository creation. The second part of it is, uh, it wasn't quite fully uh, explained earlier, but uh, uh, we see the fire data being uh, available in a, in, a, in a bite size and also can be made available uh, in incremental fashion. So if you are interested in creating a, or maintaining a fire uh, a I2B2 data repository that has automated uh, fire data refresh capability, instead of uh, wipe out everything, rebuild everything uh, for the research data repository, now you have opportunity to do incremental uh, data refresh at a single patient level. And uh, so as you have got new admissions or new results and uh, 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 new encounters for the patient, and then you can take data, fire data for that patient, and uh, put it into the inbox area. And of course, that's a could be another process you can set uh, using fire data subscriptions, all these other standard capabilities, and that allows you to create incrementally, automatically refreshed I2B2 repository. Does that answer your question, Robert? Great. We always look for feedback, by the way. You know, we don't pretend to know everything and all the creative uh, use cases for I2B2. And uh, certainly we'd love to find out more from you, from the community. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so this has everything you need to set up the Docker image. Uh, if we just take a quick look at the uh, source Iris um, and then Iris on I2B2 on Fire. We'll notice that these are exactly the same as what I had shown in the Visual Studio code. But when you do the Docker, it basically uh, uh, is it, uh, Docker, it says get Docker Compose. And yeah, so basically you just do this uh, get clone and then you build it. Then you uh, basically Docker Compose up and then it's up and running. So there's only a, a handful of commands that you need to do to actually get it up and running. And that's what I did on that uh, DV1 machine. Uh, and then you can basically do a quick test of the curl and it should return a the JSON object back. Um, so yeah, so this is the, uh, the GitHub repository and this is how you get it up and running. That's really great. I'm uh, looking forward to this progressing and actually like seeing some Seeing this into production, you know, at, at, at some places, um, I think MGB is probably going to be the first. So we'll we'll keep you we'll keep you up to date on on this, and maybe be able to talk about this in uh, at the meeting in September as well. Um, all right. So I think Mark has raised his hand. So Mark, do you have a question? Hi. Yes. Thank you very much. I um, thank you, Michael and uh, Chi. Um, have a question about the README that we were just looking at on the screen. The README uh, mentions uh, GitLab, but uh, the website that we were on was GitHub. And I'm wondering, um, is the README correct, or should we be using GitHub on that um, on that git clone command? That way. Um, yes, so let me share my screen again. Um, 
So yeah, so I think I think you're right. I think the GitLab right here. So what I did was I clicked on, uh, yeah, migrated. Uh, so I think this is actually the latest code. Uh, and then it has like the same type of stuff, how to build it and how to do it. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I think that this is the GitLab with the latest one. So thanks. I was kind of wondering, I was like, wait a second, I thought I was on GitLab, but yeah, you're right. It is, uh, this is the GitLab one to use. Thank you. Yep. All right. Any other questions for this? Otherwise, we can move on to uh, the uh, the new ontology. All right, Jeff, I think you're on. All right, I'll go on camera. Um, oh, uh, did everyone? I hope everyone saw the note from Raj that it actually is GitHub for this. Um, Mike, did you see that? Oh, it is GitHub? It, it, right, right says they just migrated to GitHub. Oh, okay. Oh, so it's the other way. Was, okay. Oh, I, okay. Thank you, Raj. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So I am going to talk about something that I did not do um, because Michelle can't make it, but um, this is pretty cool stuff. <clears throat> All right. So as you know, um, the ACT ontology, formerly the ACT ontology version four is used by the entire ACT network and a lot of other people. And it's one of the default ontologies that's shipped with I2B2 along with the demo ontology. So this is, this is an important product that uh, Michelle Morris has been doing at Pittsburgh. And a new ontology version 4.1 is rolling out now. And there are lots of useful updates. Um, I'm gonna go through those as best I can. And I'll try to answer questions, but as I said, I didn't do this. So I, I've only looked at it. Uh, so we might have to pass some of these off to Michelle. Uh, there are 19 ontology tables. That means 19 different domains like procedures, diagnoses, social determinants of health, and so forth. I'm going to go through all of these. Um, five of them have not changed at all since version four. Three of them are brand new, and I think they're, they're pretty nice additions. Uh, Eleven are updated. Mostly what that means is new terms have been added, old terms have been retired uh, based on the UMLS 2022 AB. Um, which, you know, which keeps things up to date with the latest terminologies, uh, terminology uh, terms. Uh, so the unchanged ontologies, which are of course backward compatible, are vital signs, labs, diagnoses, the ICD-9 and 10, and ICD-9 procedures. So those are, oh, those are exactly the same as they were before. Um, <clears throat> Minor modifications have been made to demographics, visit details, social determinants of health, and COVID. And I'll go through each of those changes. In demographics, we've added a, a little bit more detail that you can go into. So especially under Hispanic, you can select a particular subtype of Hispanic ethnicity. Uh, there's also a few more races added to the race, race folder. Um, visits, you can optionally use a version of the visit um, detail ontology that uh, pre that you can pre-calculate the age field um, and insert it as a derived fact into your fact table uh, rather than doing it at query time. Um, and there are a few new visit types um, like uh, non-face-to-face encounters. So that, that should allow some more specificity in defining what exactly is in our data. Um, perhaps a little bit work of work and mapping to do those things, but the mapping, the, the actual rollout of this is going to happen um, in, in, in stages. It's, it's not that everyone needs to pick this up right away, which is one, one of the great things about it being mostly backward compatible uh, because you can just continue using your current ontology and kind of migrate as, as you're ready. Uh, so in the COVID ontology, new lab codes, um, including uh, post-acute uh, long COVID U09.9. Um, also, there were some uh, dead branches that uh, were removed, things that, that 
uh, oh yeah, the classification codes. That's right. Michelle was talking about that on a recent meeting. That the kind of the kind of the grouping, a certain grouping level from has been removed from Loink, so those have been removed, and there are some typos that were fixed. Um, these are all the ontologies that were updated to the latest UMLS, um, which you know mostly is just adding additional terms. In medications, HICPIX was added, which is a a whole new set of terms, a large set. And then under procedures CPT4, there were some dead end nodes that were pruned, which I believe means CPT is updated regularly and, and things are deleted that aren't used anymore. So I imagine there were some things that were removed. Um, I like these new ontologies, they're pretty neat. The research ontology um, is going to support some data quality and, um, and, and even grant proposals with uh with act i'll go into detail on more of that uh, the zip code ontology uh also pretty exciting uh, it'll enable some things with loyalty cohorts that that i'm working on and vaccination ontology too which is very important so the uh, vaccination ontology was built from uh, the cdc immunization information systems tables uh and it the hierarchy is uh, cdx group cdx code and then Underneath that, you see uh, CPTs and NDCs. So you see a CPT code for a Hep A, Hep B vaccine, and NDC code for those as well. Um, the zip code ontology, uh, the, uh, the demo, ITBC demo data ontology has had zip code for a long time, but it wasn't well organized. Uh, this, this is a, a new zip code ontology that's arranged in you in many in several different ways and you can choose which one you want to use so you can look up zip code by county and city you can look up th three digit zip code just to get more of a regional perspective um, you can look up uh, zip code by hospital referral region and these are uh, these are areas that have been defined by the dartmouth atlas uh, to define what areas uh, are typically uh, typically utilize a specific hospital. So, um, so like HRR1, there is Birmingham, Alabama. So all of those zip codes tend to use the same hospital system. Um, and, and that actually, uh, Griffin Weber has done some work to show that that is actually very predictive of whether a patient is loyal to your healthcare system if they're in your hospital referral region, um, which will help us in the loyalty cohort project where we're trying to choose cohorts that have have a higher likelihood of complete data in the database without doing any you know complex record linkage or anything um and then there's also our RUCC, which is rural urban continuum code uh how rural or urban the that particular zip code area is and uh same state organization as well and then um, there, there's this new ontology, the research ontology, which supports a number of different things. One of them is this NIH enrollment folder, which uh, has combinations of demographics that you could build this query on your own, of course, if you were just querying it. But this is intended to support an NIH enrollment table because there are specific uh, things that you need to include in a grant application to the NIH uh, with various combinations of demographics and, and counts for those patients if you're used to doing human subjects research. And this, because this can then be automated with a breakdown query, this will make that much easier to produce, um, which I think is a good value add to the, the whole ACT community and ITP2 community. Um, there are also uh, comorbid conditions. Um, there's this comorbidities folder that uh, has Charleston comorbidity and uh, well, it says Charleston comorbidity flags, I suppose, and Alex has her comorbidity flags. And those are two different um, ways of categorizing uh, conditions that tend to go together, comorbidities. And people that tend to have higher comorbidity scores, meaning they have more of these comorbidities, tend to, you know, be, be more ill and have higher morbidity. So this will allow us to kind of look at those things on the fly as well and compute um, Charleston scores. And then the 
let's see, I think that, yeah, there's, there's another slide here. So that, then when you go into data completeness, there was a little bit of this in the last version of the ontology, but it's been enhanced. So now there are ontology items to be able to quickly find number of patients with at least one diagnosis or lab or medication or procedure or total number of patients in the patient table, which I know, I know doing data quality work, those are all different numbers. And it, it, it's sometimes challenging to figure out which one you want to use for uh, the denominator when you're computing number of patients in your in your in your um, in your equations. But it uh, it's useful to have all those and have all those options. Um, there's also this longitudinal density um, counts of patients with at least a face to face visit uh, in the past years. And oh, this is under historical data, so. You can you can compute. I, I'm actually not sure if this is computed or this can be pre-computed as a derived fact, but um, but this is this is a method to be able to kind of quickly look at patient what we're calling loyalty without doing compl complex machine learning to figure out uh, a loyalty score equation, but just look at what patients have had recent visits and um, and have been actually at your site. And then um, there is a, a fee code um, ontology under uh, phenotyping over here. And fee codes are kind of higher level classifications of disease that are based on diagnosis. So, uh, so the, the, these encompass multiple diagnoses. So if you interest in patients that have can, can I know this word, but I've never pronounced it before. Well, let's go with bacterial infection out of the way specified. Uh, that you just drag that over rather than trying to gather all of the diagnosis codes that have that. And that will eventually be used to do uh, phenotyping uh, in, in, at ENACT sites and other ITP2 sites that want to participate using tools like uh, Phenorm and some other tools that are being developed but um, mostly Tianxi Kai's group uh, over at Brigham, and they this will allow us to you know very very easily see what patients have what diseases not just based on diagnosis code, which is often designed for billing and can often reflect um, only that a visit was inquiring about a patient having a disease and not actually that the patient was suffering from that disease. So this phenotyping, enabling these phenotyping algorithms will allow us to, um, again, enhance our cohorts in, in a different way and be more certain that we have patients with data that have the particular conditions that we're looking for. So I hope I did that a little bit of justice. Um, you can email Michelle if you have any questions that I can't answer. And this is the download link, which let's see if I can paste that in the chat so that people can actually click it. And I will stop sharing. Does anyone have any questions? Jeff, do you know when, or maybe you already said this, when um, she anticipates that this is gonna be available? It's soon, right? Yeah, it's available. That that link is the link to the ontology. Okay. So that that link will let you download it. Uh, in terms of when it would, you know, when we ask ACT sites to upgrade to it, that's still pending. And Michelle's also working on a version of this that has OMOP codes behind it that will help us to enhance our ITB2 and OMOP support to support also the new things in her 4.1 ontology, and that's still being done, but the, the ontology is finished and that's linked to download it. Any questions about either one of the talks? Um, also, I'd, I'd love to, if anybody has like any, um, any, any comments, any questions, any comments um, about anything, um, certainly, if you have ideas about the September um, conference, I am all ears. Um, I just, I just think that uh, you know, no matter what we put on the agenda for the meeting, that the 
beauty of that is, is really just getting everybody together and um, being face-to-face -face and sharing information. Last year was, was really terrific. So I hope people can, can make the trip. We'll make it available um, through Zoom as well. Um, although I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna announce that right away because I, I wanna try to get people to, um, to come, but we certainly, and we, and we record all the sessions too, as, as we do with the community meetings. Any other thoughts or questions? We've taken up your, um, if you're on Eastern time, we've taken up your lunch time. So you probably want to get out of here so you can go grab something to eat. I think, all right. Okay, I guess we'll, um, We'll say goodbye and thank you for joining. And we will um, we will be back in uh, in July. Bye, everyone.